searching Your love was never far You made a way to get to me You were the whisper Leading me to your heart Forever I belong to you Now I can see clearly My God, you for me You won't let go Your love won't let me down And I know it's true Yeah, I know that your love is all around I believe in you Holding on to you Stay true Even when the lights come Your word remains true Even when my thoughts don't run I will stand tall I'm from this humanity
Hey, Valley Rise Church. Welcome this morning to our Sunday service. Those of you who don't call Valley Rise home, but you're joining us this morning, thanks so much for tuning in as we celebrate Palm Sunday together. Hey, I'm so grateful for this time we get to share. I wish it was me in person with you. I wish I could hug you and shake your hands and love on your children and encourage you all and tell you you lost weight, even though during quarantine, I'm sure none of us are losing weight. We're probably all packing on the pounds and that's okay. Nobody can see us anyways. Hey, I love you so much. I just want to take a moment and thank our Valley Rise family. Hopefully I've been able to call or text all of you. If I haven't gotten to you yet, I promise I'm getting there. I'm making my way down the list of every single person that calls Valley Rise home. I want you to know from my heart to yours, I'm so thankful for you. For those of you who've continued with your tithes and offerings and your building fund gifts, thank you so much for allowing us to continue to do Valley Rise Church, for, for us to continue to push the ball across the line. You know, I've told you this several times, my hope is that our next service will be in our permanent facility. We're so close, it doesn't happen without you guys. I'm so thankful for those of you who have been faithfully sowing into this as we watch God do what only God can do. My prayer for you in this quarantine is that this wouldn't be something that sets you back, but it would be something that propels you into the rest of 2020. That the time you spend in this quarantine downtime would equip and fuel you for the rest of 2020. I believe God is doing something unique and amazing. And while on the surface it looks chaotic, how many of you know that Romans 8.28 is true? That God does work all things together for the good of those who love Him. So in the midst of chaos... I know that God is doing something amazing, and I'm so thankful that we get to be a part of it together. Hey, welcome to our Sunday service. If this is your first time with us, my name is Pastor Christian. Me and my wife, Alex, moved to Tomball, Texas two and a half years ago to start Valley Rise Church. We've seen God do some amazing things, and we're just a short bit away from getting in our own permanent facility. And everyone on the setup and teardown team sitting at home said, Amen. We're so grateful for what God is doing here. But today... We're so glad that we get to spend Palm Sunday together. Traditionally, we take communion on the first Sunday of the month, but I really wanted to save that so we could do it together on Easter Sunday. So next week, here's what I'm going to ask you. If you're going to be tuning in with us, bring some bread and some grape juice, because we together as a family, you with your family and me and our families are going to take communion together as we celebrate the amazing, beautiful story of Easter. What an amazing time that in the midst of darkness, God's going to still do something amazing in the body of Christ. Hey, I'm so thankful that we get to journey together. We get to do it together. This morning, I believe I've got a timely word for you. It's a word that's been on my heart for the last three weeks that God's been waking me up in the middle of the night speaking to me about. So I hope that you take something from it. I know that I have. And I believe that God's going to use it to do some amazing things in your life in 2020. Let's pray as we jump in. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your patience, your kindness. God, today, wherever we are, we surrender to you. God, we give you our dreams, our hopes, our desires, our wants, our goals, our fears, our worries, our concerns. God, wherever we are, we give all that we have to you. We give you our heart. We give you our soul. We give you our spirit. We ask that you would take us and do what only you can do inside of us. God, comfort the lonely. Heal the hurting and broken. Bring healing to our land, I pray, God. We ask that we would see the greatest move of God in our generation we could ever imagine, and that this would be the beginning of it. Jesus, do what only you can do, I pray. Speak to us, bring revelations to our hearts and minds. Let us leave here better than we came here, God. Bless us and keep us. Bless every family at home right now watching this. Be with them. Let your peace that passes all understanding rest upon them. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, today on Palm Sunday... I want to jump in and I want to read you the Palm Sunday story. Maybe you know what Palm Sunday is, and maybe you don't, and you're going, I don't even know why we call it Palm Sunday. I want to tell you why we call it Palm Sunday. Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Now, as they were approaching Jerusalem, they being Jesus and his disciples, they arrived at the place of the stables near the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead, saying, As soon as you enter the village, you will find a donkey tethered along with her young colt. Untie them both. And bring them to me. And if anyone stops you and asks, what are you doing? Just tell them, the Lord of all needs them. And he will let you take them. All of this happened to fulfill the prophecy. Tell Zion's daughter, look, your king arrives. He's coming to you full of gentleness, sitting on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So the two disciples went on ahead and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and her colt to him and placed their cloaks and prayer shawls on the colt. And Jesus rode on it. 
Then an exceptionally large crowd gathered and carpeted the road before him with their cloaks and prayer shawls. Others cut down branches from the trees to spread in his path. Palm trees, this is where we get Palm Sunday from. They cut these palm branches down to spread in his path. Jesus rode in the center of the procession, crowds going before him and crowds coming behind him. And they all shouted, bring the victory, Lord, son of David. He comes with blessings of being sent from the Lord Yahweh. We celebrate with praises to God in the highest. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people went wild with excitement. The entire city was thrown into an uproar. Some even asked, who is this man? And the crowd shouted back, this is Jesus. He's the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. What an amazing scripture. As we watch Jesus' last moments coming into Jerusalem, for which we know was going to be the last time he entered Jerusalem until he was going to come back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the second coming. Jesus goes into Jerusalem, and as he's going there to fulfill prophecy, he tells his disciples, go and get this young colt and the donkey that are tied up, and if anyone asks you, tell them the Lord of all has need of it. I, I think that's a crazy beginning to the story, because can you imagine the disciples he told this to? Like, hey, listen, I'm going to need y'all to go and steal these two donkeys. And if anyone asks you about it, just say, the Lord of all needs them. Can you imagine being in that position with Jesus where Jesus looks at you and goes, hey, listen, I need you to go to the store. I need you to buy, all, get all this stuff. Just take it. And if they ask you, just say, hey, Jesus needs this stuff. It would probably get me or you thrown in jail. But when the disciples did it, it worked. They get the colt, they get the donkey, they bring them back and they ride in to an amazing procession of people worshiping and celebrating Jesus, throwing palm branches down before him, throwing their coats down before him, watching the Savior of the universe come in to Jerusalem. Isn't it crazy that just a week later they would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. How fickle the world can be and how faithful Jesus can be. I want to give you today what I believe God has been speaking to me about this. I want to give you three things that Jesus is. I love how at the end of it they yell, this is Jesus. He's the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And as I read that, this is Jesus, I thought Jesus encomp uh, uh, encompasses so much. The name of Jesus encompasses so much. The persona of who Jesus was encompasses so much. The Trinity and the Godhead with Jesus accomplishes so much. So how can we take that and apply this moment to our lives? Apply this moment of watching Jesus come into Jerusalem before he's crucified. How can we take who Jesus is in that moment and make it who Jesus is in this moment? I believe that God's given me three ways to understand who Jesus is in this moment. Like I said earlier, this has been a process. This message has been in me for about three weeks to, to a month, maybe even more of God working this thing in me and, and me chewing on it. And oftentimes, for those of you who, who are in your relationship with Jesus and, and you're communicating with him and you're spending that good time, this is how it works. Jesus will put something on your heart and you'll begin to chew on it. And you'll begin to chew on it. And you'll begin to chew on it. And it's like a piece of steak. No matter how many times you chew on it, you just can't break it down. And maybe you get a little something from it here and you get a little something from it there, but you're still chewing on it. And this is how scripture works. Oftentimes we read stuff and God begins to let our heart and our spirit chew on it. And we begin to ruminate on what God wants to do. What I want to talk to you today about is one of those things that I want you to chew on. I want you to think about it throughout the week. I want you and your wife to talk about it. I want you to pray about it. I want you to discuss it with your children because it's a key foundational principle of living a successful Christian life. And it doesn't matter if it's in quarantine or if it's in the midst of the craziest work week of your life. Jesus is the same things all the time. Because while we can be fickle, Jesus is faithful. I want to give you three things that Jesus is on Palm Sunday. Number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus is the wonderful news. Jesus is the wonderful news. The wonderful news is not that Jesus is coming, although that is wonderful. The wonderful news is not that Jesus saves, although that's wonderful. The wonderful news is not that Jesus paid the price for your sins and my sins and took away our shame and guilt, although that's wonderful. The wonderful news is not that Jesus heals, that he sets us free, that he allows God to see us not in our own light, but in the light of the Son of God, although that's wonderful. The wonderful news is not all that Jesus does. The wonderful news is all that Jesus is. 
It is who Jesus is. We don't fall in love with the benefits of Jesus like we talked about last week. We fall in love with the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus is the wonderful news. He's not a part of the wonderful news. He doesn't play a so small role in the wonderful news. He is the wonderful news. And until he showed up, we were lost. The Bible says we were lost in our sins and transgressions. And even then, he still loved us. He saw you when you were at your worst. He saw you when you were at your best. And he was still willing to give his life for those of us who fell way short on our best day and even more short on our worst day. Why? Because Jesus is the wonderful news. The person of Jesus is the wonderful news. Think about when you have a child, for those of you that have children. When you have a child, they become the greatest gift that maybe you've ever received next to your salvation. Not what they can do, because in that moment they can't do anything for you. I'll never forget my dad telling me my whole life, son, one day you're going to have a son, and then you will know how much I love you. And I used to always say, dad, I know how much you love me. I mean, I'm, you're my dad. I love you. I get it. I, I love you. And he goes, son, one day you're going to have a son of your own, and then you'll really understand how much I love you. And I'll never forget the moment that they brought Eli out to me. And I'm standing there, 26 years old, 25 years old, scared to death. I don't know what to do with the child. I thought it came with a manual. I found out it didn't. We've written our own. It's not very good. Don't use it. But I was trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do with a child? Probably much like you. They gave us Eli and walked out the room. And me and Alex looked at each other and said, like, who stays in here with him, though? And they said, well, no, that's, that's you. You stay in here with him. And we quickly realized that parenting was something we were not prepared for. We had to learn on the fly. And they put that child in my hands. And I remember looking at Eli. And for the first time in my life, I knew exactly what my dad meant when he said, one day you'll have a son of your own, and then you'll know how much I love you. And I remember looking at Eli and thinking, if I love you this much, then that means dad loves me this much. And if dad loves me this much, how much more does God love me? But in that moment of looking at Eli, I didn't look at Eli and go, God, you're going to be an amazing, obedient child, and that's so wonderful, I can't wait. I didn't look at him and go, you're going to be a world changer, or maybe you'll be a pro athlete, or maybe you'll be an attorney, or maybe you'll be a preacher, or maybe you'll just be a great dad and husband, and that's going to be awesome. I didn't think any of those things. Although those dreams were all there, holding Eli in my hands, the gift of who he was was more than enough for me. Hey, I want you to know, what Jesus does is awesome, but who Jesus is makes him the wonderful news. That Jesus is the gospel personified. Jesus is hope. Jesus is purpose. Jesus is life. Jesus is joy. Jesus is peace. Jesus is forgiveness. He is all of those things personified. He's not just the carrier of them. He's not just the dispenser of them. He is them. This is an important point that I need you to get so that we can go down this road together. But you got to understand first, not only is Jesus a carrier of those things, Jesus is those things. Jesus is the wonderful news. Number two, I love this one because maybe you've had some questions about this one too. Jesus is omniscient. Jesus is omniscient. What does that mean? It's a big word. Maybe, maybe you know what omniscient means, and maybe you're like, I don't even know what that means. Christian, what is it? omniscient? Omniscient means that Jesus is all-knowing. He's all-knowing. He's a part of the Godhead. Jesus is all-knowing. That means he knows your thoughts. He knows your dreams. He knows your goals. He knows your fears. He knows your concerns. He knows your tomorrow like he knew your yesterday. He knows your five years from now. Because he's omniscient, he knows all things. Now, that's a big statement in light of walking through difficult times. Because what that means is that if he knows your tomorrow and he knows your five years, then he knew you would also be sitting in quarantine right now. He knew maybe you'd be in a frustrating season with your spouse right now. He knew where your kids would be right now. He knew where your career would be right now. He knew where your family would be right now. He knows all Things. Jesus is omniscient. He knows what you will encounter before you encounter it. Which means if he knows what you're going to encounter, then Jesus alone can prepare you to walk through those things. Jesus alone can prepare you to walk through difficult situations because 
only he knows when you're going to go through them. Jesus is omniscient. He knows what you will encounter before you encounter it. The fear, the unknown, the difficulties. Jesus knows. Nothing that takes place in your life is ever a surprise to Jesus. I remember calling my dad and some different stuff had happened and I'm calling him for advice going, Dad, what do we do about this? They said this and how do we do this? And Dad, how do I get this? And how can the world kind of make this happen? And he said to me, Christian, none of this is a surprise to Jesus. Hey, I want you to know, whatever you're walking through, none of it is a surprise to Jesus. None of it threw him for a loop. Talked to a man this week whose spouse had just left him. Guess what? Wasn't a surprise to Jesus. Talk to people that are sick this week, coming out of the hospital, dealing with the coronavirus. Hey, guess what? None of it was a surprise to Jesus. None of what you walk through in life is a surprise to Jesus. Now, let me tell you this, lest your theology get off. Jesus didn't make those things happen. But he was aware that they were going to happen. So if you get in a car accident because you're drinking and driving, hey, Jesus didn't make that happen. You made that happen. You made a decision, and there was consequences to that decision. But Jesus knew you were going to walk through that. And he also loves you enough to faithfully hold your hand and walk through it with you. Jesus is not thrown off by whatever you're going through. Jesus riding into Jerusalem, being celebrated by all of these people, throwing palm branches down before him, coats down before him, worshiping him as he comes in. And here's what you got to remember. The Jews know scripture like on a whole nother level than us. When I was in Israel a couple years ago, they quote scripture. It, it, it embarrassed me how well they quoted scripture. They quote it in English. They quote it in Hebrew. They tell you the references behind it. They tell you who wrote it. They tell you when it was written, what language it was written in, and why they used the words they used. It is unbelievable how they know Scripture. So Jesus writing in, every single Jew there was aware of the prophecy that they were saying. Okay, when in, in verse, um, verse 2, the Lord of all needs them, and he will let you take them. All of this happened to fulfill the prophecy. Tell Zion's daughter, look, your king arrives. He's coming to you full of gentleness, sitting on a donkey, riding a donkey's colt. So when they saw this, they were well aware of what this meant. And in the midst of them worshiping him and praising him and, and, and announcing that Jesus, Hosanna in the highest, is coming, Jesus knew what next week would hold. He knew that the following week they'd be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Isn't that amazing that Jesus is such a, he embodies so much grace, patience, peace, love, and forgiveness that he could smile and wave and hug the people who were shouting Hosanna knowing the next week they'd be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Hey, I want you to know if Jesus could love them, Jesus can love you. Your past, Jesus knew it. Your future, Jesus knows it. And he is such the embodiment of grace and forgiveness and goodness that even in the midst of that, he can still look at you and say, I love you and I forgive you. Me and my son were talking this week about Easter. We were talking about Jesus dying on the cross. And Eli said, can God forgive you for anything? I said, he can. That's why Jesus died to pay for all of our sins. And he said, yeah, but not like big stuff. Like, what if you murder someone? I said, Jesus will forgive you. And he goes, no, Dad, that's not right. I mean, but if you kill somebody, he'll still forgive you? How do you know? And I told him the story about Jesus being in between the two thieves on the cross and people yelling at him, crucifying, crucifying, shouting insults at him, spitting on him, hurting him, mocking him. And in the midst of it, Jesus looking at them and saying, forgive them, God, for they know not what they do. Hey, how many of you know if he could forgive them? Knowing what he knew, that he can forgive us knowing what he knows. There's nothing we hide from Jesus. He sees us the way we are. And yet he still chooses to love us. He is omniscient. Hey, whatever you're walking through right now, maybe you've been laid off from work. Maybe your marriage is in a tough spot. Maybe you're lonely or isolated. Maybe you're struggling with depression or frustrations. I want you to know Jesus is not confused or surprised by any of it. He knew what you'd walk through and when you'd walk through it. And he's waiting to walk through it with you. But we must first learn where we find our comfort and our relief. We must first understand how to walk through these things. So if Jesus knows all these things, okay, I'm often tempted to go, Jesus, you knew this was going to happen. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks for the heads up, I guess. I'm walking through this hard time and 
You knew this was going to happen. So if you knew this was going to happen, Jesus, then you also know the solution. Okay, so Jesus, what is the solution? Leads us to step three. Number three, the solution of walking through difficult times, of being in these trials and tribulations, these frustrating moments, whether it's quarantine or job loss or depression or personal struggles. What is the answer to get through this, Christian? The series we're in right now is the good news. And it's all about the good news of who Jesus is. And I think sometimes in the process of understanding who Jesus is, we begin to compartmentalize Jesus, not as who he is, but what he does. Have you ever, I know, I know my wife and me have had this conversation, and she'll say, Christian, I feel like everybody loves me for what I can do. The kids love me for taking care of them. You love me because I keep things clean. You know, the, the people around me love me for what I can say to them or speak into them. And maybe you've had that conversation with your wife, or maybe you felt like that yourself. And a moment of realizing she is not what she does. That's just a byproduct of who she is. I want to give you an example today, how to get through this. And your point three is in Jesus. In Jesus. Jesus is the wonderful news, number one. Jesus is omniscient, number two. He knows what you're going through right now. It's not a surprise to him. And number three, how do we get through those difficult times? In Jesus. In Jesus. I have a little prop here. I want to show you this. Philippians 4.19 says this, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This verse has been what I've been chewing on. This is what God woke me up in the middle of the night and gave me. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I read that sentence and I read it again and I read it again and I read it again. And I could, there was something I couldn't shake. I couldn't figure out why it kept nagging at me. And my God will supply every need. I've got a lot of needs. Maybe you have a lot of needs. So my God will supply every need. That's good news. Of mine, according to his riches and glory. Thank God he's got riches. He's got provision. He's got peace. He's got wholeness. He's got health. He's got all of those things I need. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, you're going to supply them to me. That's awesome news. Okay, how? From Christ Jesus? Am I going to get, does it read this? And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory from Christ Jesus. Because grammatically, for those of you who, who are, are grammar buffs, it should read that way. If we're going to receive these things from Jesus. It should say, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory from Christ Jesus. That is not what it says. And it messed with me. And I kept praying, going, God, what is this? What is this verse you're trying, what are you trying to teach me? And I went back and I read it one more time. And here's what it says. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you how most of our relationships with God work. We're this quarter. We're like this quarter, this 1987, ooh, I was born 86, 87 quarter. And we go through life, and life gets hard, and we come to Jesus like this quarter, and we go, Jesus, I need provision. I need peace. I need help. God save me. I need a little piece of you to get through what I'm going through. And here's how this happens. We go, Jesus, I need you. And Jesus goes, okay, here's some peace. Here's, here's some provision. Here's some goodness. Here's patience. Here's grace. Here's forgiveness. Here's, okay, this is good. And we get, some, we get some of Jesus, and we go away. But the problem is, we can't carry this anywhere. We can't carry what was just poured out to us. And so it becomes momentary. We get provision for a moment. And then we come back. The next time, Jesus, I really need provision. Jesus, I really need patience. Jesus, I want to hurt my children and my wife. They won't stop and nagging me in quarantine. Jesus, I need grace to deal with my coworkers. God, they frustrate me. God, I need healing. I'm sick. God, I need provision. I can't pay my bills. And we get a little bit of it. And then we, we go back again and we spend it and it comes off of us. And, and then we're left as a quarter again. This is the life we live if we read this verse, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory from Christ Jesus. Because what happens is we receive all of this from Jesus. And then we go out into the world and we use it. It gets shaken off. Provision, we get our rent paid. Thank you, Jesus. That was awesome. Until we need it again, and then we go back to Jesus for a little more. Patience, thank you, Jesus, for this patience. I couldn't have got through this week without you. Until we get frustrated, and then we go, okay, Jesus, I need more, I need more, I need more. 
And sadly, that is the life that most of us live, including me at times. And when I was reading this verse, God opened my eyes and gave me revelation to my heart like only the Holy Spirit can. And here's what he said, Christian, that verse doesn't say, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory from Christ Jesus. It says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. What is the difference? The difference is for me receiving from Jesus and taking out and then me being in Christ Jesus. Because when I am in Christ Jesus, I am in peace. I am in provision. I am in health. I am in wholeness. I am in sobriety. I am in grace. I am in forgiveness. I am in all of these things because it's who Jesus is. And until I realize that my relationship with him cannot be lived by getting some from Jesus and then running away until I need more and coming back to him and then running away, it comes when I reside in Christ. When I reside in Christ, it's why one of my prayers, I pray almost every morning is, Jesus, I want more of you and less of me. Because I don't want to go out there and be, I don't want to be the quarter carrying a little bit of patience out. No, I want to be in Jesus, pouring patience out to everyone around me, because Jesus never has a shortage of any of these things. He never has a shortage of provision. So when I need provision, when I go, God, I don't know how we're going to finish this building, we need this money, I don't know where it comes from, but in Christ, there is provision. So I can trust that if all of my needs can be met through the riches and glory in Christ Jesus, then that means when I'm in Jesus, I am positioned perfectly for God to do what only God can do. When I'm out of position, I may have a momentary time of goodness with Jesus. I might have a momentary thing of provision. I might have a little bit of forgiveness now, but eventually it'll wear out and I'll have to come back and get more from Jesus. We've got to learn how to reside in Jesus, in Jesus. So that like the verse says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Me and the kids were jumping on the trampoline the other day and Shiloh, my one-year-old, has just learned how to jump on the trampoline. We're all out there and Shiloh likes jumping on the trampoline when it's just her. But when the big kids get on the trampoline, she starts to get uncertain. The trampoline gets really turbulent and they're trying to double bounce each other and she gets really shaky and scared. And here's what she does every time we'll be on the trampoline and as soon as the big kids start really jumping, she looks to me and goes, hold me, hold me, hold me, hold me. And I pick her up and now we're jumping together and she's having a blast. And I was in the middle of doing that the other day and I had this thought. Nothing's changed about where she's at. She's still on the trampoline. She's still in the confines of the netting of the trampoline. Her big brother and big sister are still jumping on the trampoline. What makes the difference between her having peace and her losing her mind is whose arms she's in. When she comes in daddy's arms, she knows nothing's going to happen to her. She knows I'm going to take care of everything. She knows if it gets crazy, I'm going to stop jumping. I'm going to remove her from the situation. I'm going to ward off trouble. I'm going to ward off her big brother and big sister. When she's with dad, she's not worried at all. The circumstances did not change. Just whose arm she was in changed. Hey, I want you to know the goodness of Jesus is that when we live a life in Christ, in Jesus Our circumstances may not change. The fears may not change. The troubles around me may not change. But the one who is holding me in his arms changes everything. And now I don't have to be insecure because I'm secure in Christ. Now I don't have to worry about my provision because in Christ he is supplying all my needs. Now I don't have to worry about where my next meal is coming from because if he cares for the sparrows and the birds of the air, how much more does he care about me? Now I don't have to worry about my peace because in him is peace. I don't have to worry about all of these troubles that the world is going through because in Christ there is stability. Hey, I want you to know on Palm Sunday, whatever you're walking through, In Christ is the answer. In Christ is the answer. In Christ is peace. In Christ is provision. In Christ is your marriage being restored. In Christ is your friendships being healthy. In Christ is addictions being broken. In Christ is goodness and grace for all of those people around you. In Christ. I encourage you today, in the midst of all that's happening in the world around you, let's make a decision. Not to receive from Christ, 
but to reside in Christ. Not to receive from Christ, but to reside in Christ. And when I reside in Christ, I receive all that I need. Let me tell you what that looks like, just real practical. I was praying the other day, and I was saying, God, I have this need. You know, I need this, and God, we need this, and the church needs this, God, and my family needs this, God. And there was a moment where I stopped, and God brought this to my mind, and where it all came together. And he said, Christian, you're standing here asking for these things from me, that if you just resided in me, you would have all of them all the time. Hey, when I reside in Christ, this is what it looks like. Jesus, I know you're my provision. I don't know where my rent check's coming from, Jesus, but I know in you, I am provided for. So I'm not even going to worry, God, because I know that you've already gone before me. You know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know what's going to happen in two weeks. You are well aware I was going to lose my job. You were well aware we weren't going to have church for a month. You were well aware of this thing happening. You, it's not a surprise to you at all. So Jesus, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to reside in you. And I'm going to be at peace because in you is peace and provision. That's what that looks like. Now my heart has changed from wanting something from Jesus to just wanting to be with Jesus. And when we make that switch, it makes all the difference. It's the stability. It's us jumping up in our dad's arms in the middle of a turbulent trampoline and him going, hey, listen, I can care for you. Because what seems like turbulence to you is a tremor to me. It's nothing. What seems like fear and craziness to you in my arms is fun. We've got to learn to reside in Christ. Hey, as we close, my prayer for you is that in this season, you would find yourself in Jesus. That you would find yourself in Jesus. That your peace would be in Jesus. That your provision would be found in Jesus. That your relationships and your family and all that maybe you're going through would be found, resolved, settled, cared for in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the good news. He's the wonderful news that none of us could have ever had a relationship with God the way we do without Him. He knows everything we're going to encounter. None of this is a surprise to Him. And then we must make a decision to reside in Jesus every single day. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, today, we come to you and we ask Jesus, first of all, forgive us for the times we've wanted from you but failed to reside in you. Forgive us for the times we've got our needs met momentarily, temporarily, but we've never put eternal residence. We've never dug our stake down and said, Jesus, I'm going to reside in you no matter what comes. And so, God, we've been shaken by the events that have happened around us. Today, Jesus, we make a decision to reside in you. A decision to find ourselves in you. A decision to receive in you, not from you. And that as we live a life like that, we're going to see you do more than we could ever imagine. Jesus, forgive us. Reside, Jesus, in our hearts and let us reside in you. So that we can truly grow together, not because of the benefits of who you are, but from enjoying the personification of who you are. Enjoying, Jesus, all that you are. We love you. We just want to be close to you, Jesus. We want a relationship with you. And Jesus, we know as a side effect, all those other things are cared for. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and maybe some of you watching this today, you go, Christian, that sounds great, but I've never made that decision to reside in Christ. I've had experiences with God. I've gone to a church service. Maybe you've encountered religion, but you've never made a decision to have a relationship where you reside in Christ. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. You're at home. Maybe you're with your family. I just want you to bow your heads, and I want you to repeat this after me. You can say it out loud. You can pray it in your heart. You can say it under your breath. As long as you mean it is what I ask. Dear Lord Jesus, today I recognize my need for you. Jesus, I recognize that I've never made the decision to reside in you. But today, Jesus, I want to make that decision. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came from heaven to earth to live a perfect life, a life I never could have lived. And then, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross. I believe you died a death I deserved. A price I should have paid. But you paid it for me. So that I wouldn't have to. 
Then Jesus, I believe on the third day, you rose from the dead to give me life, hope, and freedom. Today, Jesus, I choose you. I choose to reside in you. I choose to trust in you. And I choose to put all of my hopes and securities in you, Jesus. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, I love you. And if that's your first time making that decision, I am so proud of you. Please DM us, email us, connect with us. We want to help you on this journey. We want you to know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And he's given you a spiritual family to do it with. We may not be together right now, but we're staying connected and close. And I know that God is preparing an amazing body that once this is over, is going to be able to receive so many hurting and broken people. Hey, it's a privilege to get to do this together. It's the joy of my life to pastor Valley Rise Church to have relationships with each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, I encourage you, if you've come prepared to worship with your tithes and offerings, maybe you've given them this week, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. None of this happens without you. And like I've said last week, in the midst of us not having to pay rent for the building, that is all now going towards our new building, and we're so close to finishing it. Doesn't happen without you guys. I'm so thankful for you. If you want to give, there's three ways that you can give. You can give at our mailing address. You can give online at valleyrisechurch.com. Click the giving link. Or you can text Valley Rise in the amount to 77296. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing us to continue to be your church. It truly is the greatest privilege of our lives. Hey, next Sunday, we're going to be right back here for Easter Sunday. I encourage you, get your communion, get your family ready, have fun with it, dress up. Just because we can't go to church doesn't mean we can't be the church. And we're believing that as we pray and as we stand this week that we're going to see God open the eyes of the blind, draw in people's hearts, and maybe these messages will meet someone, will reach someone they never would have reached if it wasn't online. Hey, I love you so much, Valley Rise. It's the privilege of my life to be your pastor. I can't wait to see you again. Tune in next week, 10 a.m. for Easter Sunday at Valley Rise Church. We love you. We'll talk to you soon.